Hi everyone, it's Mr. Vallejo. Welcome to class. Uh, today in biology, we'll be taking a look at cellular respiration. And so let's go ahead and go to our PowerPoint slides for today. So let's share that screen with you. Let me remind you, like I always do, that these PowerPoint slides are available for you in your learning management system, whether that is Canvas or in Schoology. So today, cellular respiration, including glycolysis and going on to the Krebs cycle and the electron transport system. Um, I think that in your particular course, this might be the topic, toughest topic to comprehend and understand and learn. But I think that you have a good background now, especially since uh, the last lecture, when we uh, took a look at some of the key background principles of energy and enzymes. Um, let's take a look at last time. Uh, what is energy? Uh, we saw that it's the ability to change and do work. We saw that there are a couple of different states. There's kinetic and potential energy, and there are many different forms of energy. We looked at the first and second law of thermodynamics. We said that uh, the first law says that energy is not created, nor is it destroyed. And the second law says that things go from, from an ordered state to a disordered state. That second law is also called the law of entropy. Then we studied redox reactions. We saw how that transfer of electrons um, uh, is, uh, is moved to, from, from one uh, chemical to another, from one molecule to another in a reduction oxidation cycle. And we saw the uh, high energy electron acceptor NADH as a very good example of that that we'll see today. We studied enzymes and activation energies, and we saw that enzymes lower the activation energy required to start a chemical reaction. That's a catalyst. And uh, we saw that uh, enzymes are organic, uh, that they're proteins, that they, these proteins have active sites on them, and that the rate of the reaction is affected by many different things like temperature and uh, pH and concentration of certain chemicals. Then we looked at ATP as well. So, um, uh, let me remind you about ATP specifically because that is uh, tantamount today to understand today's topic. How many ATPs can be made from one glucose? Well, it turns out that we'll see that uh, it's an awful lot. Um, how cells make ATP? Well, cells make ATP through two different, two different mechanisms. One is the substrate level phosphorylation and one is chemoosmotic generation of ATP through a membrane. So first let's look at substrate level phosphorylation. Um, this represents this moon-shaped thing here, it represents an enzyme. And in this enzyme is this active site. And this chemical uh, here, PEP, sits right in the uh, active site of this enzyme. Now over here, here's another active site. This is where ADP sits. And we say that this is a coupled reaction because this reaction is happening right here the phosphorylation of this phosphate. Um, so this phosphate group is going to move, but it's going to move over to this chemical in this other reaction. So as this phosphate group moves over to here, that creates ATP. So we have two different chemical reactions. We have peptipyruvate, and then we have ADP to ATP. But these two reactions occur together, so we say they're coupled reactions. Now through substrate level phosphorylation, what's gonna happen is we're gonna be able to generate four ATPs from, um, the, uh, from the reactions uh, that occur uh, in, the, in what we call glycolysis. And also we're gonna see that uh, some ATP is generated in another set of reactions called the Krebs cycle. So this is going to result in, in four ATPs, two ATPs in each of those cycles that I mentioned and four total for one glucose molecule. Now, that doesn't sound like an awful lot, but what's gonna happen is chemoosmotic generation of, of, uh, of ATP is going to result in the rest. Now we say it's chemoosmotic, and we know these terms already because we studied them in this course. We have a chemical gradient, and we have 
an osmotic gradient or slope or a change in, um, in between before and after. So you have a chemical and osmotic gradient. Over here, you have a lot of protons on the outside of this membrane. This membrane is an inner membrane of the mitochondrion. Over here, on the inside of the inner membrane of the mitochondria, this area here, which is called the matrix, there's fewer protons. So these H pluses are going to want to go right through there, through this uh, transmembrane protein, this transport protein, uh, this uh, this ATP synthase, which is an enzyme. You know, it's an enzyme because it ends in ASE, and what this a uh, what this enzyme is. Uh, involved in is in synthesizing ATP, hence the name ATP synthetase, or the ATP synthase. Now, what happens is these protons move straight through there, and for each of these protons that moves through, one ATP is generated. That is to say, here, this, uh, the movement of the, of the proton in powers the phosphorylation of this or inorganic phosphate, so that it connects to this uh, ADP molecule, and that creates the ATP or adenosine triphosphate. Hence the phosphates here, you have two phosphate groups in orange, and here you have three phosphate groups in orange. But for each proton that goes through, you're gonna get one ATP. Now, this diagram shows us the same location as the previous uh, diagram. This right here, is this right here. There's your ATP synthase again. Okay, each NADH causes three protons, three protons to be pumped to the inner membrane. So if each NADH causes three protons to go to the inner membrane, how many ATPs are made from one NADH? Well, if three protons go through and there's one ATP per proton, that's gonna result in three ATPs for each of the NADHs. Remember, the NADH is a high energy electron acceptor. But there's not just one NADH, there's going to be 10 NADHs in cellular respiration. So if we have 10 NADHs and we have three uh, ATPs made for each NADH, guess what? That's going to be 30 ATPs. So that's much more efficient than the substrate level phosphorylation that we saw just a moment ago. So how many ATPs are made from cellular respiration? Well, four from substrate level phosphorylation. And then we're gonna see that it's not just 30, but there's 34 from chemoosmotic generation because there's another higher energy electron acceptor that we're gonna to add to the story when we get to the Krebs cycle called FADH2. So when you add those together, four and 34, you get 38. But we're also gonna see that it's gonna cost two ATPs to transport some of those NADHs from the cytoplasm to the mitochondria. Well, we're totally done with today. What's gonna to happen is you, I'm gonna give you this diagram or you're gonna print out this diagram. And um, if you know this diagram, you will know cellular respiration as well, if not better than any second year biology biochem student at a major university. If you can fill this in, this is what you need to know. So we're gonna do this together in a little bit. But let me, in this talk, give you the, uh, the nitty gritty. Let me give you the information. Let me give you the uh, details of the uh, processes that happen in cellular respiration. We're gonna take a, glycolysis, uh, take a look at glycolysis. And after glycolysis, we're gonna take a look at uh, fermentation as a side trip. Uh, here's glycolysis again. But uh, after glycolysis, after you get the pyruvate here and here, there's two separate diagrams. Um, we could go straight into cellular respiration or could take a left turn and go into what we call fermentation. We're going to take a look at each of those um, options. Then we're going to spend more time on cellular respiration and go through the citric acid cycle, which is also called the Krebs cycle. And then we're going to take a look at um, how uh, all those NADHs are going to get cashed in at the electron transport system. So that's where we're headed. I'm gonna go and give you an overview of cellular respiration. Then we're gonna go uh, look at each of the steps of cellular respiration. We'll take a look at glycolysis in more detail. We'll take a look at fermentation. We'll take a look at this little part of the arrow right here. This is called the oxidation of pyruvate. We'll look at the citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle. 
and then we'll take a look at this area right here, which represents the electron transport system. Okay, so there are four different steps of cellular respiration, and we have multiple slides for each and every one of these steps, but let's take a look. <clears throat> During glycolysis, glycolysis happens in the cytoplasm and does not require any additional oxygen. Now, all the rest of the um, reactions happen in the mitochondria, and they do require oxygen. So when something requires oxygen, we say it's aerobic. So the oxidation of pyruvic happens in the mitochondria, and it's aerobic. The Krebs cycle happens in the mitochondria. It also requires oxygen. It's aerobic. And then the final step is the electron transport system. That happens in the mitochondria, and it's aerobic. So the last three happen in the mitochondria, and, uh, and they require oxygen. The first step happens in the cytoplasm and does not require oxygen. So glycolysis, again, happens in the cytoplasm. It's independent of oxygen, does not require oxygen. So we say, here's a new term, it's anaerobic. So it's aerobic if it requires oxygen, just like if you were at the gym and you were working out and you were huffing and puffing um, during uh, some kind of aerobic activity while you're breathing and you're required, requiring oxygen as you do that. This is the first step. This is glycolysis, step one of four. In glycolysis, uh, you're gonna see that two ATPs are made directly and two NADHs are made. So um, that's glycolysis and that's a scorecard for glycolysis. The next step is called the oxidation of pyruvate. It's just a little step, it's just one chemical reaction. It happens in the mitochondria and it requires oxygen. What you see here in this chemical reaction where you have pyruvate and then you have the pyruvate converted to acetyl coenzyme A, what happens is you're gonna lose a carbon dioxide, um, but you also are going to make some NADH. Remember, these are high energy electron acceptors, and for each one that you get, you're gonna get three ATPs off of that eventually. Here's the Krebs cycle. The Krebs cycle, um, named after Dr. Krebs, but also I'll call the, the uh, citric acid cycle because the first chemical here in the chemical reaction cycle is citrate or citric acid. And it's also called the TCA cycle because these chemicals right here are tricarboxylic acids. So that's what TCA stands for. So this happens in the mitochondria, it's aerobic, it's the third step. Um, only two ATPs are made directly, but we're gonna see that there's six NADHs that are made, and that's gonna result in a lot of ATPs. Hopefully you can figure that out by now. You have six NADHs, and you have three ATPs per NADH. That's 18 NADH, uh, 18 ATPs you can make on that. On top of that, you have a second electron acceptor called FADH2. Um, you have two of these, and these are not quite as efficient as NADH. Instead of making three ATPs, FADH2 is going to make two ATPs. So two times two is four. So um, if you recall the previous slides, um, a few back said that you're going to get 34 ATPs. Well, this is how you get your 34. You get six times three, you, you get 18 there. You got two uh, FADH2s give you another four. And then from glycolysis and from uh, the uh, uh, oxidation pyruvate, you've got four more NADHs coming in. And four times three is 12. So the electron transport system in the mitochondria is aerobic, it's the fourth step. And this is where actually 34 of the ATPs are made. You can see the proton pump. And, uh, and what you see in this picture is that, is that you have a you have a chemical gradient, you have a chemical gradient and you have an osmotic gradient. And so these guys want to go back in to the matrix of the mitochondria, but they have to pass through this transmembrane protein, ATP synthase. So when that happens, uh, you have uh, the ATP is, uh, is made when you have this proton passing through here and then the ATP is generated. So let's take a look at these um, chemical reactions in more detail. First, you have glycolysis. Glycolysis, you have um, you have some reactions. Now, as a biology major, when I was sitting where you are, I had to memorize all these. And so you have glucose goes to glucose six phosphate goes to glucose one six phosphate. Look, I'm not even 
not even it goes to fructose one six diphosphase p p uh, uh p gal dhap and so on and so forth and it keeps going and going and so uh you just uh these are just things you memorize uh, as a biology major or as a chem major or a biochemistry major. For our purposes, you need to know the, uh, the end products. You don't need to know all, all of the reactions and you don't need to know all the enzymes associated with the reaction. But the information I do want you to know is glycolysis means split lysis. We've seen that before and glyco it has to do with a carbohydrate, in this case, glucose. So we're gonna split this glucose. You can see glucose is a six carbon sugar here and actually halfway down the chemical reaction that changes to a, a five carbon sugar, but then it splits up. So here you have two of these three carbon sugars. And so we split the glucose and everything I, from, from this point on happens twice. So if uh, you see right here, you can see that ATP is used well, um, that's not just one, but that's two ATPs used. And over here you have ATP is generated. So not just one, but two ATP, ATPs are generated. Okay. Um, actually in this one right here, this is ATP being made. So you make two ATPs here, you make two ATPs here, but you lose one, two there. So that's how you get your two ATPs all together. Um, you're also going to have, remember, if you double from this point on, not just going to get one NADH, but you're going to get two of those high energy electron acceptors. So two ATPs are made, but ultimately six ATPs are made. And why is that? Because let's go back and look again. If we look at the yellow ATPs, here's lose one, negative one. Here's another one, lost, negative two. Then you gain two, which makes us even. And then you're up to right there. So two ATPs are made through substrate level phosphorylation. But then you have the NADHs. And the NADHs, remember, for each NADH, that results in three ATPs. So two times three is six. Well, six plus these two is eight. But the trick is that these NADHs are in the wrong place. These NADHs, in order to cash these in, you got to take them to the mitochondria. Uh, last week, someone called me up and said, hey, welcome, uh, you uh, have uh, you've just won, congratulations, uh, a trip to the Bahamas. Uh, we have a cruise for you at uh, six nights, seven days uh, to uh, from Fort Lauderdale to the Bahamas. Woo, I want a cruise. Isn't that great? Well, maybe not. Uh, maybe not great, but at least it's a free trip. But hey, in order to get this though all you have to do is get to fort lauderdale oh man how am i gonna get the that's gonna cost me hundreds of dollars so um yeah it's a not such thing as a free trip but also with this nadh hey you're gonna get six six uh atps off of those two nadhs nah because you gotta transfer you gotta you gotta take um, some energy and use that to move this from the cytoplasm to the inner membrane and the mitochondria. So it's gonna cost you a little, it's gonna cost you two ATPs. And that's why it's not eight, but it's eight minus two, which is six ATPs. So each NADH results in three more ATPs, but it costs two ATPs to transfer the NADHs to the mitochondria. All right, this is, uh, this is your scorecard. You need to know there's two ATPs, there's two NADHs, and that one glucose molecule molecule gets cut into two, three carbon uh, molecules called pyruvate by the time we're done. So that's what, that's what you need to know for glycolysis. Now at the end of glycolysis, what could happen is, um, is that in bacteria and yeast, uh, in, the, in the absence of oxygen, they'll go ahead and continue uh, to, uh, to process the uh, uh, chemical reaction so that they can pick up more energy. Now this says in bacteria and yeast uh, that, that they'll form ethanol in a process called fermentation. Why do they even do this? Well, they do this so that they can pick up another NAD, okay? Now these NADHs are great. And you remember you get three ATPs for each of these NADHs. 
but if you can't get the NADHs to the inner membrane of the mitochondria, then it doesn't matter. It's like having a coupon or a hundred dollars off of I don't know four tires at the, at the at the tire store. But if you don't buy any tires or you can't get to the store, you can't use the coupon. Same thing with these NADHs. Um, you got these NADHs, you can't cash them in. Well, it doesn't really matter if it's a good deal and you get three ATPs off of this. Um, instead, these guys uh, are waiting around and, and someone says, hey, instead of three ATPs, I'll give you, I'll change your NADH back to an NAD for you. And at first that doesn't sound like such a good deal, but if you do change these NADHs back to NAD and pop them back in the second half of glycolysis, what happens is you have a chance to make another ATP. Another ATP is not 36 ATPs, but it's more than zero. So if you regenerate an NADH, so that another ATP can be produced from that NAD. Now, um, over here we call this chemical here acetylaldehyde, the final electron acceptor. Uh, these arrows represent the paths of electrons in these chemical reactions, and the electron finally stops here at acetylaldehyde. So that's why we say acetylaldehyde is the final electron acceptor in ethanol fermentation. Now, another type of fermentation happens in our bodies, in our muscles, and, and if there's a case where um, you can't get enough oxygen uh, quick enough uh, in your muscles, but you still need to go. Like if you're running a, a really long marathon race or a half marathon or something, and you're after 50 minutes or so, uh, your muscles uh, are still going, but you but you totally need more energy. You've already uh, maxed out the ATP stores that are in your blood system, and you need more. Well, what happens then is that we have what's called lactic acid fermentation or lactate fermentation. Same process that we saw on the previous slide called fermentation. And for the same reason, you're going to take these NADHs, turn them back into NAD, so you can regenerate an ATP. It used to be thought that lactic acid uh, formation was associated with uh, muscle fatigue. Um, there are other reasons for muscle fatigue, but uh, I know from practical experience uh, that, that when I used to lift, uh, the really huge guys would take a plate, uh, you know, like a 50 pound plate and hold that straight in front of them so that uh, uh, the lactic acid would, would move out of their pectoralis majors. Uh, out of their chest muscles. So, uh, wives tail, uh, uh, well, it certainly might be one factor that has to do with uh, muscle fatigue. All right, let's go to the second step. We have uh, covered glycolysis. Now we take a look at the oxidation of pyruvate. The oxidation of pyruvate, once again, is, uh, is oxygen dependent, so we, it's aerobic and it happens in the mitochondria. It's the second step of the uh, four steps that are part of cellular respiration. Some of your books, especially if you're using an older textbook, might call this decarboxylation of pyruvate or the decarboxylation of pyruvic acid. Um, and we call it decarboxylation because you see that carbon dioxide going away right there. <clears throat> This does not produce any ATPs, but it does produce NAD, NADHs. It produces two of them. So from these two NADHs, you're eventually going to get six ATPs. So that's a pretty good deal. Um, why do we breathe out carbon dioxide? It's because of the carbon dioxide that comes out here in this step. And we're also going to see that some carbon dioxide is produced in the next step called the Krebs cycle. So this is actually a pretty short step, but some important stuff happens carbon dioxide, and uh, NADH2, we get two of those. Now here's the third step, the third set of chemical reactions in the Krebs cycle. In the mitochondria, we have uh, the Krebs cycle, and this requires oxygen, and it's aerobic, and these are all the steps of the Krebs cycle, which is the third step in the cellular respiration cycles. So we're gonna take a look at that in, in, in a little bit more detail. And so if you take a look at the reaction, you don't need to know the reaction. But if you ever do, if you, uh, if you dig this stuff so much that you become a, a graduate student in biology or biochemistry, uh, this is the way I memorized it. Can I ask Sally for my ostrich? 
that's one, another one of those mnemonic phrases. So uh, this is uh, citrate, which is represented by the C and can. So this is uh, citric, isocitric, alpha keto. Uh, this is succinic, fumaric, malic, and oxaloacetic. Oxaloacetic is over there. So um, this is a trick you can use to memorize just about anything. Make up a silly phrase and then you can use that to help you remember things that you need to remember. Now you don't need to remember all that. I might, but you don't. And so what you need to know is, well, what really happens during the Krebs cycle? What happens during the Krebs cycle is that you get six NADHs, which results in six times three, 18 ATPs. You get two FADH2s, which is two times two, which is four ATPs. And you get some carbon dioxide released as a byproduct. So there's some more carbon dioxide coming out. Um, that's significant. And that's why we breathe out carbon dioxide. On top of all that, you have two ATPs that are made through substrate level phosphorylation right there. So that's what you need to know about the citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle. Now it's time to go to the bank. The bank is the electron transport system. This is when you take your, your Cuban money and you take it and you turn it in and you exchange it for Canadian money or whatever you're changing it into. So here's the electron transport system. You're going to take that NADH, you're going to take that FADH2, and you're going to exchange it for ATPs. These are the chemical reactions that happen. These are the reduction oxidation cycles that happen. These are the enzymes. You can see that many of them end in ASE. Are these enzymes that catalyze the reactions of the biochemical cascade that make up the electron transport system. Here's ATP synthase again. It's a, a nicer picture which shows you that transport protein. You can see these protons on the top that are moving to the bottom. And as they move from the top to the bottom like that, what happens is this guy spins. And as it spins, you, it produces an ATP uh, by taking the energy from that proton movement in that uh, uses that energy to phosphorylize and take that inorganic phosphate and adding it on to ADP to get ATP. Here's another picture showing that, and you can see that some of the um, enzymes that are involved are embedded in the, uh, in the inner membrane of the mitochondria. This one's stuck on top in an exterior protein in relation to the uh, inner mitochondrial membrane. These guys are transport proteins within, and they are transferring those protons out. And finally, ATP synthase accepts those protons and uh, is able to uh, phosphorylize the inorganic phosphate, adds it onto ADP to make ATP. And just as we had a final electron acceptor, and fermentation, we have a final electron acceptor in our uh, cellular respiration cycle. That final electron acceptor is oxygen. As we follow uh, all the arrows on the diagram, uh, what happens is finally oxygen, right here in this diagram, oxygen is able to take those electrons that are traveling on these paths, and that oxygen combines with those electrons finally, and that makes water. Now this water is unique, it's called metabolic water. You can see the chemical reaction right there. It is said that kangaroo rats don't have to drink because they'll, get, they'll make enough water um, this way. They'll make enough metabolic water uh, to keep their bodies moving. That doesn't mean they won't drink. Uh, I did uh, two weeks of desert research when I was working on my master's degree. Uh, one night uh, and several nights actually uh, throughout our stay, we had to trap kangaroo rats. And I can tell you that a kangaroo rat will drink water, but if it never does, it could still survive uh, because of the, of the production of metabolic water and also by um, extracting water from their, from their foods. Uh, with, uh, without making too much of it, uh, what they do is they store their foods under the ground in their burrows which have a higher relative T 
humidity than the dry desert air. And so any moisture, even though it's a little bit of moisture, any moisture that's in the air in their burrows will actually uh, go into their foods. And when they eat the foods, then uh, they uh, can extract that, that moisture right there. So overall, it says overview of glucose metabolism, uh, the balance sheet, and you can see it adds up to 36. And if we take a look at it, you can see here's the two ATPs through glycolysis. There they are right there. Through glycolysis, you also make two NADHs, which result in two times three, six ATPs. But remember, these NADHs are in the wrong place, so it's going to cost you one ATP each. That's why this is four. In the second set of, of reactions, the oxidation pyruvate, no ATPs are made, but two NADHs are made. So two times three is six. You get six ATPs. In the third set of chemical reactions, you got the Krebs cycle. And in the Krebs cycle, you got two ATPs, you got six NADHs and two FADH2s. And then when you take all that to the electron transport system, you can cash in all these NADHs, all these FADH2s, and what you get then is uh, over here, six times three is 18. Over here, you get two times three is six. And then remember, FADH2 is not as efficient as NADH. So you're going to get two ATPs instead of three from an FADH2. And when you add that all together, you get 36 ATPs. That's pretty tremendous compared to the uh, one glucose molecule that you started with. Now, not everything you eat is carbohydrates. Um, you also have proteins and fats in your diet. And if you can take a look here, here's your glucose molecule. And when you metabolize it, you get 36 ATPs off that. When you do that to a protein, you don't get as much energy, you get 12 ATPs. And when you break up a fat molecule, uh, the fatty acids that make up a fat molecule are actually really good to store fat. So you can see here, and 131 ATPs of that fat molecule. It's not as readily available though, and it takes a while, so that's why your body doesn't just do that all the time. Here's a diagram that says amino acids break down starting at pyruvate and acetyl coenzyme A. So they don't start at the very beginning of the reactions that we went over, but they jump in a little bit later, and you can see that in the next diagram um, after this one. You can see that fats also don't start from the very beginning, um, but they'll start uh, at acetyl coenzyme A right here. And uh, over here, you've got the glycerol and the three fatty acids. So this one does start pretty much back at the beginning, um, but uh, uh, not, the, not the whole molecule isn't, uh, it, it, the whole molecule, when it breaks down, it's going to generate a lot of extra energy that does it this way. So now that we've studied um, cellular respiration for glucose, we can better understand and more easily understand uh, cellular respiration for different molecules like fats. And so you can see it again here. Here's your glycerol and your fatty acids jumping in at different parts of the chemical reactions that we just studied. So what we just studied is right here, glycolysis, there's pyruvic acid, there's acetyl coenzyme and the Krebs cycle, and the electron transport system. So that's what we just covered for a, a carbohydrate. But if you have an amino acid, you can see they jump in at different parts. If you have a fat, you can see the glycerol and the fatty acids are jumping in at different parts. All right, we do have a worksheet. It's called the overview of cellular respiration that I'd like to do um, with you. We're gonna review this worksheet together. And so let's go ahead and do that. Uh, if you have a copy of it, that would be great. If you don't have a copy, you might wanna pause right here and get yourself a copy of that, print that out in your, or from your learning management system. All right, if you know this diagram, you'll know all the important things that you need to know in order to understand cellular respiration. So cellular aspiration starts in the upper left-hand corner with the molecule glucose. I want to point out that this line here represents energy, and this line here represents a reaction as it starts over here, and as the reaction goes, we move along this line. 
Okay, so at the beginning of the chemical reaction, we have glucose. And glucose, in the first set of chemical reactions, uh, which are known as glycolysis, you get two ATPs. And after you have your two ATPs, you also have um, the uh, generation of a three carbon sugar called pyruvate. And uh, not only do you have two ATPs, but you're going to get two NADHs off of that. And I want to remind you that you crossed the line right here. So crossing that line is going to result in, in, uh, in an ATP being taken away. It's going to cost you an ATP to make that journey. So instead of making six ATPs from um, those NADHs, you're only going to get four ATPs. As we look at fermentation down here, we can say, see that there's different types of fermentation and the different types of fermentation uh, are the ethanol fermentation and the lactic acid fermentation. Both of these are aerobic, or excuse me, anaerobic, um, anaerobic uh, processes. And you're gonna see that uh, it, it does not require oxygen. So remember, we call those aerobic, uh, aerobic uh, reactions because oxygen is not required. All the other steps, steps two and three and four, are going to require oxygen. So that's why we call those aerobic. And then remember, the first step happens in the cytoplasm, and all the rest of the steps happen in the mitochondria. So that's uh, glycolysis. That pyruvate then goes on to the second step in the oxidation of pyruvate. I'll remind you that there's no ATPs that are made directly from this, but you do get two carbon dioxides and two NADH2s. So there's your NADH2. Remember, two times three is six, so you're going to get six ATPs off of that, and you're also going to generate some carbon dioxide there. All right, in the next step, which is the third step out of four, you got the Krebs cycle, the citric acid cycle, or also called the tricarboxylic acid cycle. You're going to get some ATPs. You have two ATPs that are made through substrate level phosphorylation. You've got six NADHs, and then you also have two FADH2s. So that is a lot, but those don't mean anything until you get to the last step, and the last step, you have the electron transport system, and you've got 10 total NADHs here. You've got two FADH2s right there. So you've got 10 times three is 30, and two times two is four, which is gonna give you 34 ATPs. So you got your 34 ATPs from uh, the NADH and the FADH2 from the high energy electron acceptors. That oxygen that's right here is your high energy electronics, uh, excuse me, it's your, it's your final electron acceptor. Remember, th these arrows represent the journal, uh, journey of electrons as they're coming around and going through all these biochemical systems. And then finally, that electron ends up at oxygen. And when you add an electron uh, to oxygen, um, you're going to get water, and that's metabolic water. All this put together is 36 ATPs from one glucose molecule. So that's very efficient, and a lot more efficient than just having substrate-level phosphorylation that we saw at the very beginning. All righty, so um, that is uh, our study of, of the uh, electron transport system and uh, the Krebs cycle and the oxidation of pyruvate and also glycolysis. And all that together is known as cellular respiration. I'm Mr. Vallejo, thanks for listening. Hope you learned a lot.